Hi, uh, everyone. Uh, glad you're all here. Glad you're coming into journalism, uh, which is a strange thing to say because uh, this would be a hugely challenging environment that you're entering, uh, and many people would be incredibly negative about it. And there is no doubt that newspapers, as newspapers, as newsprint, are in decline. Uh, if you look at the sales, they're in decline. Uh, if you look at their online uh, access, uh, then that it, things aren't so bad. And that's why it's not only a challenging environment, but a massively, massively exciting environment uh, to be coming into. Because the opportunities uh, are, that are offered by what I call the digital revolution are, are just terrific to behold. It may not mean uh, that you'll be joining what I'll also dare to call big media or mainstream media. It may be uh, that you'll be entering smaller enterprises, but that in itself is not something that should concern you as much as we veterans, uh, not me of course, because I am a far-seeing visionary, but many of my <laughs> veteran colleagues uh, would say um, it's all over. The game, uh, to use a well-known phrase, the game is up. It isn't up at all. If you look at the dawn of newspapers, if you go right back to the beginning of newspapers, they began in much the way that many digital startups are doing now. Small enterprises committed to the community, committed to providing information, committed to the activity of journalism as distinct from making money. Now, because you've got to make your money, you've got to be funded, and so on, uh, and we can discuss later the problems caused by the breakup of this business model uh, with the business models to come. But let me uh, start, I suppose I ought to start with, with the excitement. Let's, let's, let's start with where we are going. It, it, it is doubtless the case that staffs of previously uh, and apparently, um, I suppose, eternal newspapers are in decline. Uh, the numbers have gone down uh, dramatically. Uh, from when I worked on my first local paper through to my uh, regional evening, I also did a stint uh, in the mid-70s when uh, at university I was also moonlighted on the evening Argus. It was all uh, very different then. There were huge numbers of jobs uh, available and a great moving around and a great sense, really. And part of this is the function of the economy of the 60s and 70s, which is so very different from the economy today, a feeling that there would be jobs easy to get. It is undoubtedly much more difficult to get your feet under the table now, but that's what you need to do. You need that experience, you need to strive for work experience, to get internships, uh, and to keep persisting. Because persistence is a journalistic virtue. I say it's more about perspiration than inspiration. It's more about, uh, it, it's always more about persistence than simply thinking things will come your way and you do have to be pushing. But the pushing, if you've got the right skills, if you get your NCTJ certificate, if you do the law, the shorthand, the English, if you come on with the range of skills that you would have more naturally than people like me, multimedia skills, then these are highly saleable items. You have the possibility of of doing things which uh, people with grey hair, mine's painted on of course, people with grey hair uh, can't do or won't do or just cannot seem to adapt to wish to do. But these are skills which we call uh, available to what we call digital natives. I hate to call you all digital natives but in a way you will, many of the things that you can do that my grandsons uh, can do uh, come second hand. I, I, my iPhone is totally and utterly uh, the province of my 11 year old grandson. Uh, 
He does the whole thing. I have a problem, I give it to him. He sorts out computer problems for me. There's a, a professor at, at Sussex University, a professor of artificial intelligence, an expert on computers, and he fixed her computer this weekend. These are because they were born to this. You were born to this. And that is a huge advantage because what we need in journalism now is not merely those journalistic virtues which you have been taught, doubtless, by the good Mr. Gooding. Those are not just the journalistic virtues, but being multimedia skills that are going to push us on another generation. If you look at the history <coughs> of newspapers, the great, the great thing about newspapers as they developed through the 17th and 18th and 19th centuries and into the 20th, the things that happened were that the great journalists of their age weren't merely doing journalism, they were inventing ways of doing journalism. If you look back to the great grandfather of investigative journalism in this country, W.T. Stead, who we're celebrating in a strange way because he, he went down on the Titanic a hundred years ago um, this month, uh, Stead invented how to present stories. He didn't just do stories, he thought, this is a big story, how do I present it? Similarly, the great architect of tabloid journalism at the Daily Mirror, Guy Bartholomew in the 1930s, didn't simply stick to the idea that, oh, I've got to write good headlines, I need to send out my reporters to do this. What uh, uh, Bart, as he was called, what Bart did was invent ways of projecting pictures more. More importantly, he invented the blocking of how we then in those days did pictures under old hot metal. So these are, these are, these are skills, if you think in a multimedia way, that you can bring to bear. When Alan Rusbridger, the editor of The Guardian, says, what I want to hire are not journalists. I want to hire people who have skills in computing not just computer skills, but skills with a computer that can push us on, show us quick ways of doing things, be inventive. If you look at the Guardian site, you'll see a massive commitment to, <coughs> to data and so on, all of which has been created by people who wouldn't normally be regarded as journalists, but who pushed us on uh, in an inventive way. So, uh, I think this is terrifically exciting. Similarly, I think that the acts of journalism being started up across the country, whether it be in Litchfield with the Litchfield blog, or whether it be Pits and Pots in Stoke-on-Trent, um, and that lady in Darwin, and Rick Wagstaff in, in Norwich, and so on, what these people are doing is showing how we can create <coughs> good journalism by starting again with the basics. And why have we done that? Because, as I said earlier, <coughs> the old business model, the idea that we can live off advertising, which is exactly what we've done, is no longer possible. Advertising, advertisers don't want to pay for appearing in newspapers. Uh, I think display advertising is lasting longer than most because display advertising itself doesn't work very well on the net, but they are. They're, they're into videos and all sorts of things and sticking stuff on YouTube and most importantly advertising themselves through pushing up their lines on Google and they're not necessarily interested in coming to newspapers anymore. As for classified advertising, there's virtually, <coughs> excuse me, I'm suffering from a bad cold. Uh, ad uh, classified advertising is absolutely useless in newspapers, really. If you want to buy a car in Rotherham and you live in, in, uh, in Brighton, you can look on the net for it. If you want to buy a house elsewhere, you can look on the net. You're not, not restricted anymore. If you want a car, you can get a dozen examples on the net. And that's no good. We've lost our ability to simply live off those advertisers. Similarly, the uh, local government and central government are no longer willing to pay the money that it costs to advertise in newspapers. So that's why the decline is occurring. It's not a decline of journalism. There has been some decline in journalism, what we can talk about, but the real decline is in the possibility of raising the funds that pay journalists. 
It's about the business model. It's not about journalism itself. It's not even about sales. If you look at sales over a 30 to 40 year period, um, you'll see that they're on, they've been on a gentle slide for a long, long time. Accelerated because of the net. Accelerated definitely in the last 10 years. But it's a long-term decline in the reading of newspapers. But we don't need to worry about that. Because if you look at the figures for people now accessing news online, they've taken off. That's where your life is now, lived on screen and not in print. Still, wonderful print. We don't want to... I, I, can, I can still get that feeling of going up the back stairs of the Lancashire Evening Telegraph in Blackburn and the smell of the newsprint, and I can reproduce that, at least in my dreams, what weird dreams you might think I have, but anyway, I can reproduce that in my dreams and love it and fall and still be in love with it and still hanker after it. But it's useless doing that. It's useless, it's just a lovely memory, but it's, <coughs> it's not where we're going. So it is challenging, too, as well as exciting. And I think the other challenge we can't ignore <coughs> is that we also, and I'm sure you're all massively interested in the Leveson Inquiry, um, we're also facing a crisis, I think, um, of, of really asking ourselves what journalism is for and about the ethical challenges that we're facing in journalism. I'm sure that, like all my students at City University, um, ethics is, is a key subject. And I think that uh, the phone hacking saga has made it more so than ever before. A bit of a joke in Fleet Street that once upon a time they all thought ethics was just a county to the east of London. That, that, doesn't, that, can't, that can't hold anymore. We can't be cynical about what we need to do. We have to say to ourselves that our journalism needs to be proper journalism. Now you can discuss whether that means that we need to know about the love life of Amy Winehouse, we need to know about the inside secrets of Jay Jude Law um, and, uh, and Sienna Miller or whatever. Some people think that that's important. I happen, in spite of having been a popular paper journalist, I happen not to find that too enervating. But what we do know is that journalism still, at its serious level, provides a really important basis basis for our democracy. Note this, there is no democratic country in the world without a free press. And there is no free press in any country that is not a democracy. And so they go hand in hand, and we mustn't lose sight of that. We are a handmaiden to democracy, if you like. We are both something that aided it to occur, and we are something that sustains it and ensures that we don't slip back and lose it. Um, I deal a lot with, in my blog, with countries where there is a lack of freedom, where journalists are being killed, tortured, imprisoned, and I'm constantly reminded that these people would be not going to jail to ensure that we knew about Wayne Rooney's love life, they are willing to go to jail to be able to, true, to tell truth about corruption in their governments. And it takes us right back to the beginnings of our own journalism in this country when people were prepared to go to jail uh, in this country in order to have that kind of freedom. So Leveson, in a way, although one can be critical about Leveson, one can be critical about why it was set up, one can be critical of some of the people who've appeared before it and whinged away, one or two of them, but essentially it reminds us of the basic function that we're here for. To speak truth to power, to hold power to account, to act as a watchdog, a watchdog on each other in the media, because the media is a huge institution too, a watchdog on government, a watchdog on big business. And it's that which I think gives us which... I didn't come into journalism for that reason because at the age of 17 when I came in I, had, I thought journalism was going to be glamorous. I didn't realize that 
Um, it would involve going to Barking Court every day or covering Barking Council in East London, which somewhat tarnished the idea of glamour. So I had to, as it were, learn the reasons I came into journalism. I think one of the great things, one of the huge changes in my lifetime in journalism is that people now come to colleges and universities and are already getting versed in ethics before you go into the job. That means you're asking questions of your employers, you're asking questions of your editors, you're asking questions of yourself before you even take up the job, which we didn't necessarily do in those days, although they were gentle and probably less harsh, uh, and we weren't forced to do things we didn't really want to do in those days. Levison reminds me that one of the things you might want to talk about is about whether or not in the compact that comes out of Leveson, we might see the entrance of, say, a conscience clause, which is something that... Are there any members of the NUJ here? Have you joined yet or whatever? Okay, the NUJ are pushing very closely for the conscience clause, which is to be able to stand up in your newsroom and say to the news editor, no, I won't do that, and not face the sack for doing it. Sounds a bit idealistic. But I think we ought to think about how that will embed an ethical response in newsrooms. Something that we, that we ought to uh, think about as we go forward. Uh, you know, one of the problems that we face in dealing with Levinson, in coming to terms with the awfulness of phone hacking, because it is an awful thing to have done, um, is that many of us who've been in the job as I have for almost 50 years, we, we really, it grew and grew and grew. A lot of people think, oh, that's a terrible thing that phone hacking happened. But in a way, we were slaves to pretty dodgy practices over the years. Too much subterfuge was condoned. Uh, subterfuge is a good weapon. And by the way, just let me just say straight away, I do believe there could be cases in which phone hacking would be justified. If I was to receive good information from a good source that the Prime Minister was privately negotiating an arms deal with a Saudi billionaire, which might seem far-fetched, but in fact it's exactly what the Minister of the Crown did back in the 1980s. But if I found out that well, let's use that example. If Jonathan Aitken, the responsible Tory minister back in the 80s, the Guardian found out uh, that he was probably negotiating with a Saudi arms billionaire, they did all sorts of other things to track it down. But if I found out that I could have accessed his phone in order to have discovered that, then I would say that it was reasonable to break the law in those circumstances. I don't think we're above the law. I think that we should say, I did it, I broke the law, and I'm willing to take the punishment. But in other words, it's not the methodology of phone hacking that's wrong. It's not the methodology of <laughs> subterfuge. It's not the methodology um, of covert filming or covert taping. <coughs> These things have a legitimate reason to be used, but they must be used for good ends. And that's why I think that one of the things that will emerge from Leveson there's already, you're seeing emerge, Keir Starmer, the Director of Public Prosecutions, uh, is into this territory too. Lawyers are hovering over it. Draftsmen in the Commons are probably, lo uh, 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 are probably looking at it. And that is to define what is public interest, to define the justification that we should have for doing the things we do. Now, I couldn't see the least bit of justification for nearly every single example we've seen of hacking that the News International have so far paid out for. Quite clearly, they wouldn't have paid it out if they thought they were justified in any of those cases. And we're talking 50, 60, 70 cases already, and they haven't even heard mine yet. So um, I'll be a millionaire, I don't think. But uh, it, it is quite clear that the hacking went on at an industrial scale, it was used for trivial reasons, and the very reason we know about it, the very reason it emerged in public, was because it was used for incredibly trivial reasons. Do you all know why it emerged? No? Okay, it's a very simple thing. 
There was Prince William. Uh, a little story appeared in a tiny gossip column in the News of the World called Black Adder. And in Black Adder it said that Prince William had hurt his knee playing football. And he couldn't understand how the News of the World got to hear about that. And then it emerged also in the same column that he borrowed some taping equipment, some recording equipment. Uh, and not only was he baffled by that, but the man who loaned him the recording equipment was baffled too. And he happened to be none other than Tom Bradbury, the ITN uh, uh, political correspondent. And they, uh, because they're such good friends, he didn't think, oh, that's Tom Bradbury leaking on me. He rang and Tom said, yeah, I was baffled about that too. Do you, uh, is it possible someone's listening into our phone calls? <laughs> From that small beginning, over such a trivial couple of paragraphs, from that small beginning, Special Branch investigated, found, of course, the phones had been hacked, found that Mr. Glenn Mulcair, the former footballer turned private investigator, had been responsible, tracked back from Mr. Mulcair to the fact that he was operating for the News of the World, found a few other examples of it having happened, hacking into, of all people, the chief executive of the professional footballers, uh, uh, players' representative, Mr. Gordon Taylor, found out Sienna Miller had been hacked, found out Max Clifford had been hacked, there's a good reason, and um, the House of Cards came down. Of course, News International locked it out for a long time, but what they always tell you about every story in the world is that when you commit a crime, when you do something bad, Watergate, in America is a classic example, it's not so much the crime that gets you into trouble, it's the cover-up of the crime. And the cover-up instituted by News International, which of course Rupert Murdoch famously last week has now admitted, although he's admitted it in a rather interesting way, he's saying, look, you all say there was a cover-up, I, mean, cover I was covered up too, no one told me what was going on. Well, we'll have to see whether that could even be truthful or not. I tend to think it probably was largely truthful. I don't believe he did really know what was going on. Whether or not he would have sorted out, as he said, is a different matter. But the point is, they covered up. And that cover-up by a major media organisation has brought about the crisis. But the crisis is, just let me widen that slightly, the crisis is not merely for national newspaper journalists going about their business, the crisis is also stretched out into the regions, uh, into local and regional journalism too. There's a sense of nervousness about where we stand. I think I'm optimistic. I'm optimistic about your future. I'm optimistic about what happens after Leveson. And that is that I think <coughs> good sense will prevail. And I think that we will see a journalism, if we get the right result, I think we'll see a journalism which is better behaved, <coughs> not suffering from great regulation, I don't think that will happen, but I think better behaved because we will, as I say, underpin everything by saying, is this responsible journalism in the right, for the right reasons, out of public interest, not simply that which interests the public. I want to make clear, by the way, that those two things about which you surely have heard a lot the difference between public interest, the difference between what interests the public, is that uh, everything that goes into a newspaper can't be in the public interest. I accept that. I accept that. But that which is merely interesting to the public should not be intrusive, should not be libelous, should not be harmful to the rest of society. As long as that, I'm quite happy that we know X about Simon Cowell or why about Madonna, I don't really mind about that, as long as it doesn't, uh, that it's not salacious and that it's not intrusive. And the reason I'm, I think it's important that we row back is because I saw, I think every responsible journalist saw that what was happening over a period of years, and I wrote about this extensively over the years, is that the that journalism which was merely interesting to the public, and which bred 
the kind of intrusive methodology, the subterfuge, the covert filming, and eventually the <coughs> hacking, actually was leaking over into serious journalism. We were in danger of the same techniques being used uh, for, uh, in an irresponsible way across in, uh, in so-called serious journalism too. So we were holding MPs up to ridicule, not for things that really mattered, but for relatively trivial things. For instance, their private lives and so on. <clears throat> and the culmination of this sort of nonsense was what happened to Max Mosley. Now, I'm not somebody who pays five prostitutes uh, to beat me on the bottom and shave my bottom and whatever, but I entirely understand that if they want to do it and he wants to pay for it, then that's a private matter. Um, the idea that uh, he should be held up to ridicule uh, was nonsensical. And, the, and again, it was that irresponsible journalism which almost led to us having a law passed in uh, Europe which would have made our journalism that much more difficult. Prior notification, which is a, a good idea, but if it's absolutely cemented in, uh, in statute, then I think it would inhibit some of the journalism we go about. Um, let, me, let me finish by saying that uh, when, I'm, when, I do, when I speak like this, I, I hear myself preaching. Uh, which is a very, very bad thing, and, uh, uh, and solemn, and uh, whatever, and I, I, don't, I don't mean to be. Journalism, throughout my life, uh, has been also a tremendous amount of fun, and it, there is fun to be had. We've got, we're going through a very bad, uh, sort of, I suppose, a period of introspection, which is causing us to perhaps lose our sense of humour. I don't, I don't want that to happen. I, I want us to get back uh, to a lot of the fun that we had. Um, in the days when there were lots of us engaged in this because of the amazing drawn out process and there were lots of people around, lots of people who never, <clears throat> who never even got their stories into the newspaper. Some people, there was a famous feature writer on the Daily Mirror called Martin Wainwright. Martin Wainwright, I think it was. Uh, who didn't get anything in for three years. And he so, uh, got so little in the paper that he never came in in the end. And so we used to call it, he used to, there was this little chair in the office called the Martin Wainwright Memorial Chair. <laughs> <coughs> he did come in once a week, but that's to pick up his expenses, which shows you how, how clear they must have been. So, we, uh, uh, and that said, that, that def those days are definitely over. The numbers people have come in and they've said we're not having any more Martin Wainwrights. And that, I think, most of us would agree is a good thing. Um, but what, uh, if I go back to my point right at the beginning, and I'm going to stop any second, Jan, but I, I, just let me go back to my point at the beginning about the exciting times you could have. It, it is no doubt that with the collapse of the business model, we are also possibly going to see uh, the collapse of big media, the collapse of media organizations on the scale that they are now. Lots of startups occurring, a retreat by big media from certain places, certain towns, certain cities, and the growth of media in their place. And it's a reminder, really, that we probably for 150 years, but certainly 100 years, uh, we'd seen the growth of uh, big media, and with big media come big media barons. And the big media barons are the personalities that people tend to remember. Uh, people like Beaverbrook and Harmsworth and Northcliffe. Um, and, uh, and of course my former employer, Robert Maxwell. Now these were larger than life people and, there are, uh, and there were, uh, it was awful working for them. But that was often relieved, <coughs> often relieved by humour too. We had, uh, when Robert Maxwell rang the news desk, he rang from many floors above. The news desk was so scared of him in the mirror that when he rang, the, um, the news editor sprang up from his chair. So we all knew that Robert Maxwell was talking to the news editor. Um, he was, that was such a scary figure. That, the, the humbling, humble, most humble day of my life, the humbling of Rupert Murdoch shows that these were largely figures who were uh, not as powerful as they wished us to believe.
And I'll leave you with just a couple of... I should never do this. My wife says, don't tell any more Robert Maxwell anecdotes, but I can't help myself. When I worked for Maxwell, he was in a largely massively eccentric and crazy mercurial figure. You couldn't second guess what he was going to say. An example, when he took over the mirror, he walked into the People newspaper, where the People was allied to the mirror, and he just bought it. He walked in through the entrance, and the commissioner, uh, we used to have commissioners with, you know, lots of, done in full uniform with lots of egg on their epaulets and so on. And um, he said, hey, uh, uh, s -s -s sorry, Mr. Maxwell, he tried to stop him. And Maxwell said, how dare you try and stop me entering this building? Do you know who I am? He said, well, uh, you're Mr. Maxwell. He said, you're sacked. So, uh, the next man into the job, uh, same uniform, passed on, probably didn't fit in very well, realized that if Maxwell entered the building, he knew the story, he mustn't on any circumstances stop him. So in walks Maxwell. The man just sits there and lets him walk past. Maxwell suddenly turns on his heel, comes back and says, why didn't you stop me? You're sacked. And that was, <laughs> that was the difficulty of dealing with the man. He was absolutely impossible. He once got into a lift in the mirror, and there was a man in there smoking. Maxwell had lost a lung and couldn't abide being anywhere, like all reformed smokers, he hated smoking. And uh, he said to the man, put that cigarette out. And the man said, no, I won't. He said, I'm Robert Maxwell. This is my building. Put the cigarette out. And the man said, no, I won't. So Maxwell said to him, how much are you paid? And the guy said, 150 quid. So Maxwell reached into his pocket and gave him 150 quid and said, you're sacked. Which was a pity because he was a courier to the building. <laughs> <laughs> and finally, and this is absolutely true story from my, from my time on the mirror, uh, I was on the Mirror, editor of the Mirror, in 1990 when the first Gulf War occurred. And uh, I sent off uh, two reliable people, um, so reliable I can't remember both their names, so I can remember the photographer's name, Ken Lennox. And they rang me from Heathrow and they said, we're really sorry, but we're, we've decided not to go to uh, cover the Gulf War. I said, well, this is crazy. <laughs> what do you mean you don't want to go? We fought to get you visas. Everyone on the staff wants to go. You, you fought like tigers to be the two who are going. And they said, yeah, well, what you don't understand, Roy, is that just before we were leaving the building, we were called in by Robert Maxwell, who, first of all, his grasp of geography didn't seem good because he told us that while we were in um, Qatar, uh, we should beware of Delhi Belly. But um, apart from that, he demanded that we sell encyclopedias to the troops in the trenches. And has put us in touch with uh, Maxwell. One of Maxwell's many firms that he owned was Caxton Encyclopedias. And um, these were absolutely impossible. They were out of date. No one wanted them anyway. Um, and uh, so he thought, here's an opportunity, lots of troops, nothing to do all day, might as well sell them encyclopedias. So I had to tell the guys to get on the plane and I would deal with it. And of course, when I told Maxwell, as always, he went, okay, fine. Because he never retained a thought longer than maybe 10 minutes. He once summoned me from Ireland where I was taking a weekend and I thought this must be dramatic and I got on a plane and Oh, terrible taxi and all the whole thing. I got in his office and he said, what are you doing here? I thought you were an island. I said, well, you told me to come back. <laughs> Did I? Didn't really know at all. So these are fun things. Uh, uh, and it's why I think, you know, we, uh, to finish on that, just that note, these extraordinary characters have ruled the world. Murdoch, you've seen, has ruled the world. Politicians have paid court to them for no particular reason beyond the fact that they believe the newspapers influence how people vote. I'm not absolutely convinced by that myself, but we can talk about that. But the important thing is that I think in these exciting challenges ahead, the managing directors and chief executives of these large combines, the four major combines that rule nearly all the regional media, the great old-fashioned modern press barons of the Murdoch uh, and uh, uh, Harmsworth variety, these are these are now going to make way 
for a new generation, and you, you are the ones who can take advantage of that. Okay, take some questions. about the collapse of big media because I thought that as well um, but what I don't understand is how the business model is going to sustain startups do you think that it's almost going to be hobby journalism in which case how are people going to have the time and the um, contacts and access to be able to, to bring in the stories that are in the public interest particularly when the public interest is quite a lot like the public act of being it's quite a British thing well, of course, I think one of the interesting, uh, that's a two part, an interesting two part question. Uh, let me deal with the second bit first. I, I mean, I do think, uh, and uh, I think this is an important matter of our culture, is that there is a disengagement from what I call civic life in Britain. Uh, fewer people vote in local elections than was once the case, uh, fewer people appear worried about what's going on in their local areas. Look at the Brighton evening. We have no local paper in Brighton, uh, no local weekly across the whole city. We have uh, a daily paper which sells mere 27,000, 28,000, where once it was doing 105,000 when I was there, because it's gone down dramatically because I'm not there. Um, <laughs> and, and this would be true in many cities and many towns across Britain. And I think it's really important, did the public apathy cause the collapse of newspaper sales, or was it what was in those newspapers aided the apathy? Chicken and egg, really difficult to decide. Uh, but there is no doubt that to, can we re-engage people, can we use newspapers, can the startups re-engage people in, uh, in, in civic life, in taking part in, I, I think that's a really, I can't really answer that question. But when I come to the, to the business model, which is the real problem, I think we, I, 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 uh, next Monday, I hope to be presenting in The Guardian uh, a report by the cooperative societies in which they are putting forward the idea of, uh, of replacing, completely replacing, most of the big companies with cooperatives. Um, I don't know whether that's hopelessly idealistic, but they, you know, the cooperatives have had an interesting history in the past, and maybe this is the time to re-engage. But I think that the important thing about the cooperative idea is that it's part of the debate, part of the number of uh, alternatives that are being discussed. There is, of course, philanthropy. Philanthropy has been used in ProPublica Pro Publica in the States, the Bureau of Investigative Journalism in England. Uh, I don't think that we can rely totally on, on philanthropy, except if you look back to the history of newspapers, that's how newspapers started, largely by philanthropic people. Of course, they were people that wanted to get their ideas across. These philanthropists nowadays have to, in fact, say, we refuse to get our ideas across. They have to say, we're not all-powerful panjandrums. We ought to think about sponsorship. We ought to think about lower levels of advertising. I mean, some people won't have advertising at all. There's a really interesting startup in Muswell Hill in London called My Muswell, which absolutely won't take advertising at all. Thinks it's the devil's milk, buttermilk, and therefore won't, won't trade with it at all. But it has to find some way of, uh, of actually raising funds. And so it's seeking other ways. And of course, the favorite pure way of doing it is through crowdfunding. Probably the most key crowdfunding, uh, the advanced pioneer crowdfunder is, um, is spot.us, spot.us, it's in, the, in California. Indiegogo, is that another one? Another one. Yeah. These are, these are, the idea is that the people pay for you to investigate. The people pay for the stories to go in. Uh, you get together, you say, I think that um, that, uh, that road crossing needs looking at. I think that that big factory is spewing out things I wanted investigated. You pay for it. You get your money back if it's taken up by MIG Media, who pay for the story themselves. Some ways, 
the Bureau of Investigative Journalism is doing that, it's getting money back from big media by selling them stories. So that's another possibility. And of course, there's paywalls. There's whether people are going to say to themselves, I so want to read that material, in spite of everything, I might pay a subscription, whether it be, I think, Rupert Murdoch uh, said, uh, and I think, you know, whatever I might say about Rupert Murdoch, I think he's been a huge visualizer of the future of the press, and the true visionary, because he was the only one that saw uh, the importance of pay TV, the only one saw that he could make TV work through a satellite. You've all grown up with it, but I was explaining to my uh, middle grandson the other day, and he's lying in bed just wondering at the idea that there was a world once with only four TV channels. He, he, he thought, you know, I mean, he thinks I'm ancient enough already, but he thought that was kind of weird. Did you have electricity, he asked me one time. Um, but that's how fast the world, that's how fast the world has moved. And Murdoch's part of that. Murdoch was part of that, and really early on in his career he saw that. We used to joke about our meetings at the Sun with Rupert in which we were wanting to talk about the paper and he was wanting to talk about transponders, and we didn't grasp what transponders were at the time. Um, and so I think it's really important to see that the movement uh, away from traditional ways of doing things is such... Anyway, to get back to Murdoch, Murdoch's point, Murdoch said that the iPad would be a game changer. And I think he's right. Tablets are game changers. But they're game changers also in terms of how we might think about your worry about business, which is that people do, be, do seem to be prepared to pay for apps in the way that they're not prepared to pay for a straight paywall. So we've, we've noted at The Guardian that people pay for apps because we are committed to not having a paywall, um, the, the Times, and we can't work out the Times figures, but the Times clearly have done better through their app than they have through the straight paywall. <coughs> so, if we can re-engage people in the idea that local journalism counts, and that local democracy counts, and that it affects their lives and they can affect change, I don't know whether local mayors are going to make a big difference to that, but maybe that is something that would make a difference. The important thing is we have to reinvent. Uh, I think it was uh, Kovach and Rossensteel in their latest book, Blur, which came out a, a year or so ago. In Blur, they seem to say, which I think is a really interesting thing, that we have to change the audience as much as we change ourselves. We have to tell the audience why our journalism is important, and they have to understand what they can contribute to journalism. And I think that that re-engagement will occur because we know that journalism is going to be, unlike in the days when we started, when I started out, all of it was top-down. We were the secular priests, and we told people what was important, what was news, and what wasn't news. We selected. And one of the big differences on the net is that people tell you what they think is important. And it's that conversation between what I call the cohort, the cadre of, uh, of professional journalists, trained journalists, people who've been through what you're going through now. It's the relationship between them and the audience, the people Jay Rosen calls, the people formerly called the audience, the relationship between people, the public, and journalists, and if that relationship can develop, I believe a re-engagement re can occur. But it's challenging. It's a huge challenge. Huge challenge for you. Uh, I'll be in my dotage when this, when this happens. Some people think I'm already there. Yeah. Um, uh, a, a few of us are sort of due to finish. The year long is due to finish in four weeks' time. So we're sort of you know, out there for jobs and things. And, um, do you think that journalism is in danger of becoming quite elitist because especially for well, I'm, I'm a magazine student so I'm looking at magazine jobs and every time I've gone on work experience there's people who are sort of at the bottom of the, of the, the ladder so to speak and they're like oh yeah I did an internship for a year and a half before I got a job like this and you think well not everyone's in a position to be able to do that and I was looking through jobs and there was actually a job you know a writer an editorial assistant a proper job not even advertising an internship and it was wages, expenses, 
and that was it. And it seems like there's more and more, of, um, I suppose, with this recession and less money coming in from advertising, they're trying to get so much more for without paying out the wages. So you think, do you think there's that danger of it becoming completely elitist and quite narrow-minded, I suppose, in a way, because you're only going to get a certain uh, type of society able to to actually rise? Well, we're talking class here, aren't we? Uh, uh, it, it, what's concerned me, as the years have gone on, uh, as I've been uh, teaching at City University, is whether or not we are attracting a broad range of people, or are we only attracting the rich? Uh, first of all, um, I don't know how much you pay here, but it's 9,000 quid to do a master's, at, a one-year master's at, uh, at City, and, uh, and you've got to live in London. And then, you've got to probably do lots of unpaid internships. And that restricts, for me, uh, the uh, the entrance and I by the way newspapers are not the bad boys in this it's magazines who are very very bad indeed big multinational companies like Condé Nast disgracefully using unpaid interns over lengthy periods or switching interns so they do three months here and three months there uh, I've railed against that I've uh, there's a lovely site called um, wannabe hacks that have done some, that have written about this, one or two of their people have written about it and I've picked up on it and I am absolutely opposed to this way. I do understand that we want, that, that employers want to absolutely make sure they're getting the right person, but I think it's an underhand thing to do to expect people to work for three months either on very low pay or no pay um, and I think that's wrong and I don't know the union of railed against it too, quite rightly, uh, but it's something that uh, is worrying in terms of creating, as you would say, an elitist group of journalists. The contradiction is that we're seeing less elitism as people do start-ups and so on, and they, they engage and, uh, and the public participate, um, but that's at newspaper level. I, mind you, I think magazines are coming, you know, a magazine... Uh, Magazine companies are in the same position as newspaper companies in, in this problem about losing sales and, uh, and needing to, um, to go online. And they're not doing so well online, many of them are not doing so well online as newspapers, where there's a hunger to, uh, and because Google uh, News by its very nature puts newspapers ahead of magazines. So, uh, what I would advise you to do is to come aboard newspapers. And <laughs> but I'm worried, and I, more seriously, I shouldn't say that, but I'm really worried about, about how the misuse of, uh, of young people, because that's because there are more of, our, more of you chasing few jobs, and it's therefore a buyer's market. And uh, I think there should. I, I think this is actually a matter for legislation. I think there should be legislation to prevent this gross exploitation. There's the, I was reading an article the other day. Actually, there's even a website now where you can pay them money to do an internship. So you yes. can pay like a hundred pound a day, and it, like you might go to a hairdresser's or a recording company, or yes. um, um, and you're actually paying them to do that internship that is, uh, rather than even getting expensive. That would bound, was bound to be the next stage, wasn't yeah. it? Really? Uh, I mean, that uh, you must send me some material on that, then, uh, and I'll take it up on my blog. Uh, there have been other examples. By the way, there was a thing called Total Guitar. I saw the other day that you can become a, it invites you to become a reviewer, but you don't get paid for doing the review, you just get free tickets <coughs> to the concert. Uh, I don't know, that's, I don't know whether that's a bit dodgy too, yeah. I'm just wondering who's the most difficult person you've ever interviewed and how you dealt with that? The most difficult person I've interviewed? Yeah. Well, I've done, I, I must admit, um, uh, you, don't, you don't want to be caught sometimes interviewing, say, other journal. I have to interview journalists, and uh, it, uh, I, I don't want to name names, so I, 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 
But, <laughs> but interviewing, interviewing journalists is a nightmare because they know every trick in the book. And they also go on and off the record. I, I, I'll tell you this. I've got, I've got tape recordings of, of interviewing editors where it is impossible to know when they're on the record and off the record because they go on and off all the time. So in the end, I've had to uh, send them the copy and say, was this on or was this off? Uh, and uh, as I say, I don't, I don't want to uh, say who that is because then I'd be giving away that they gave me a lot of interesting stuff mm -hmm. off the record. Um, I, don't th I don't think I've really, uh, you know, when I started out, every interview was an absolute nightmare, um, you know, when I was young and so on, uh, 17, it was real, really kind of difficult. Um, but why, for you, because of your lack of experience? <coughs> yeah, lack of experience and, uh, yeah, because it was interesting, when I, I did um, day release college, uh, in those days, so every Friday we would go off to whatever. Uh, but you really only learnt your journalism from the bottom up, and uh, and we didn't have a big enough staff uh, at the Barking Advertiser um, to for us to go out with anyone else. So you had to kind of do it on the hoof. And I was very shy, as you can tell, and um, I I found it really difficult to uh, to interview people. That was nothing compared to my first death knock, which I don't, I still, I can recall the look on the face of the man, of the brother of the man who died when I knocked on the door, and it haunts me sometimes. I still wake up sometimes shivering from that memory, because death knocks, uh, he happened to be incredibly antagonistic. But I've, since then, after that, many death knocks were quite, Amazing, you know, people will invite you in and uh, they wanted to talk about their uh, loved one and so on. But um, it, I think death knocks are far worse than doing any interviews because you never knew. So I suppose about five out of six of them, they'd be great. But it was always that sixth one where someone would look at you up and down and say, how disgusting you are and get lost and so on. And that was tough to take. Time for a final couple of questions, very quick ones. Yeah, please. Um, on the flip side of talking about elitism, you have touched about the fact that the audience is now um, uh, working with and contributing to journalism, and um, uh, nearly everybody is blogging and tweeting and so on. Do you think that that's a good thing? Because I think that there's a lot of chatter and there's a, you have to work your way through it, and you know, how valid do you feel really? That, that is, because not everybody, I don't know, I've got a... Right, well, I, th I mean, look, uh, uh, let's not stop people writing what they like or blogging or whatever. Uh, the important thing is, is what the skills we bring to it as journalists. Our job uh, remains the one it's always been, which is to make sense of the chaos and the cacophony. Now, that's always been what we've needed to do. It's just that the chaos and cacophony are really much more available to other people too. So our job really still is the same, to interpret, to analyse, and to present in a coherent way to the widest possible public our understanding of the truth. Now, <clears throat> some bloggers are mad. Uh, <laughs> It, and they used to write to newspapers and use green ink. And now, they just simply write that shit on the net. And you just know. And, but what, what, what other people accessing material, you'll get the green ink reader reading the green ink writer. And you can't stop that. And the conspiracy <laughs> theories will go. 9-11 you know, was in fact an American conspiracy. And, uh, and they did it so that they could invade Iraq or Iran or some such nonsense. You'll get that. That's green ink to green ink. But, our, but I think that most sensible people gravitate towards sites where they feel they're getting credible information. And, the, and so they might go to a lone blogger who uh, is an expert on health or an expert on the motor car industry... And this person, the blogger, 
might be better at doing that than any other journalist can possibly be. But what we generally find is that these experts will come also because they want to widen their audience, will make contact with a central or be contacted by a central part of the media and that we'll work together. I, I, I thought of the motor car industry because when I was at the, uh, went to visit the headquarters of the Birmingham Mail and Post and Mail, they had, uh, the Birmingham Post had built up a relationship with a man who contacted them out of the blue about uh, the structure of the motor car industry. And they worked together on a campaign to help um, Jaguar in the Midlands. And you realized here was a case where no journalist would ever be able to inform themselves well enough as this expert. And we can have a range of experts, but if they relate back to the central media, then people will come to us because we're credible. People go to the FT because it's credible. Go to the Guardian because it's credible. Go to the Telegraph or whatever. <coughs> and they do that because these are credible sources. We go, we might go to Matt Drudge or to Pop Bitch because we want just a bit of a laugh, but we know not to believe everything in Pop Bitch um, or Matt Drudge. Matt Drudge actually boasts that at least 50% of his material is true. Oh, great. <laughs> Which 50%? Um, but you will go to the New York Times. You will go uh, to the BBC website because you know these are credible organizations. So I don't worry about the green ink. I don't worry about the crazies. I don't worry about everyone writing. Um, I think that we are here to make sense of that, to show people what's important and work together with bloggers. Um, you know, famously, uh, during the Iraq war, uh, a young man, an architect student, decided that what, what we were being told in Britain from as far as he could see wasn't the truth. And this was a man who later became known as the Baghdad blogger. And the Baghdad blogger became famous for a little while. He contributed to The Guardian, he contributed to the BBC, and, uh, and he enlarged our knowledge of what was going on outside the green zone um, in Baghdad. <coughs> And one of my great, one of the best moments since I've been working at City University was that about five years ago, um, the, the program director for the international students uh, called me just before I was about to do my first lecture of the year, and she said, when you look out, I have 300 postgrad students, but many of them come from abroad, so don't worry, We're still competing with an elite, but anyway... 300 students, so I see your faces in the, in the uh, lecture theatre. She said, and when you look out there, hidden among them all will be the Baghdad blogger. He had decided to become a journalist and, uh, and so on. I eventually met him, Salam Pax, he was also known as. And he, <clears throat> he's now gone back to architecture, but he loved his journalism for a good while. Um, so bloggers, bloggers open our eyes and can be eyes. We, we'd never have learnt as much about about what went on in Syria without people willing to tweet um, and taking risks to do so, or people doing the same in the early days in, uh, in, in Burma uh, during the, the Monk riots, uh, which have led uh, wonderfully to uh, some form of gradual move perhaps towards democracy. We know that uh, the Chinese spend more than any other nation trying to prevent news coming out from through social media in their country too. That's how important it is. It adds to the sum of human knowledge and we should be adding it up and presenting it to the public. That's only my short answer. Thank you. I think we're, we're up to time now, unless anyone's got a very, very quick question. No. In which case, Roy Green... Can, I just, can I just say something, yeah. really? I, at the end of one of our... I, I invited, because it's very controversial, uh, something we haven't discussed, but very controversial, is the difference between <coughs> uh, PR and journalism. Journalists don't like PRs, and PRs think that, um, that there is uh, a moral equivalence between PR and journalism. We're both spinners, they say. So I invited one of the foremost uh, advocates of PR, runs her own PR agency, a woman called Julia Hobsbawm, to lecture my students. And the people were really hostile. You could see the tension in the room as she spoke. And then, 
uh, came to question and answers. And somebody said to her, how much do you charge your clients? And of course I expected Julia, massively experienced in dealing with things, uh, to just hedge the question and say, well, you know, it varies and varies. She said, um, 400 pounds an hour. There was a string of people afterwards lined up to ask her how they could get into PR. <laughs> so I'm glad no one asked me how much I earn. Okay, <laughs> nice to see you anyway. Good. Yeah.